in television. Tomo Pinnacat! Oh, don't call it a comeback! so cool, man. So good. Dude, did you, like, get out and do Chicago? Did you go tear it up last night? Did you do something fun? I was waiting for you to call me the whole time. <laughs> we, I, I've done the last couple shows, yes. and Rich and I have had some quality time together, and yeah. I thought it was a thing. Yeah. I thought it was a thing. I thought it was the norm now. You're not wrong. And I sat there picking up my phone every five minutes going, maybe he texts now. He's probably busy. He's probably still, you know, doing things. Yeah. And no call, no text, nothing. Do you, have you guys, does he do this to you? Oh, all the time. Yeah, yeah it's, it's... It's the uh, <laughs> so I sat in my room and I watched um, uh, cheating movies that I've seen three times. No, I felt you and I could have. Uh, yeah, we should, have, we should have a group, a yeah, self help group, <laughs> friends of Richard, right? Yeah, friends let's go with the self help group rather than the uh, physical violence group. Good, uh, <laughs> well, that'll be up to us. It right? makes you feel so special, and then nothing. <sighs> Case of the disappearing dick. Yep. I, first time he's spoken on mic since 1978. That's the sweater. That's the sweater talking. Ladies and gentlemen, Tom up in a cat. Thank you guys. Chicago, what's up? Where's mine? It's a little early, right? Is everyone still waking up? Yeah. Did you guys get into it last night? Yeah. Oh, we got into boy. something. Wait. I know what happens at these conventions. I know what happens. Um, well, I'm very excited to be here. I haven't been here in a while. Uh, the Chicago show was always big and fun. And uh, yeah, I've been doing the circuit again. I've been, I think this is the third Supernatural show that I've done in the last month and a half. And it's a blast to hang out with you guys again. I just want to thank you for that. You guys are an amazing family. Thank you. I'm going to grab a chair if you don't mind. Hi. How are you? I'm good. Are you you're filming while you're doing it? Well, this I I'm on the phone with my friend Bertie from the Netherlands. Hi, Bertie. <laughs> <laughs> she said you have to go ask him a question for me. Yeah. So please. she wants to know if Gadriel <laughs> felt like he was going to be redeemed by the way he ended his life. Um, I, I think he, I think he hoped for some redemption. He felt that it was the only way to, 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 uh, right some of the wrongs he did. I don't know that he was, um, he was resolute or completely convinced that this was going to absolve him of the wrongs that he did, but he knew that it was something needed to be done and, and he took that, that, uh, that, that action and, and sacrificed himself. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, Bertie! I love the Netherlands. I haven't been, but I can't wait to go. <laughs> that is awesome. Hi. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say that I really enjoyed the guided meditation audios that you've done on Zen for Minds. Uh -huh. And I was wondering if you had any plans to do any more. Okay, you know what? I get asked this a lot, and I feel terrible. I, I actually recently saw Joanne, uh, who I did those with, and we spoke um, for the longest time, I swear to God, like a year and a half, because I was traveling so much, working out of town, um, 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 making babies, things like that. We just, we couldn't, we couldn't, uh, we were having a very hard time crossing paths. And so I recently hooked up with her, and we had a good discussion, and we talked. It was about a, maybe a month and a half ago. We had plans to do more. I, um, I know it helped a lot of people, and I felt really good doing them. Uh, meditation is something I believe in completely, and I, I want to share it with people. And uh, by sharing it with people, it, it helps. It helps me in my own practice. You know, it helps remind me to to keep consistent with it in life. And I know it's. It's nothing but a positive thing. I've said this many times for those of you who haven't meditated or if you're curious about it. There is no negative that will come from it. Not nothing. You, there's, 
it can only benefit your life. And I'm talking even five minutes a day. It's five minutes of silence in the morning. It's, it can be really, really transformative and, and incredible. Or it can, be, it can be subtle. It can be something that's, you know, it's, it's, it's little increments. It's something that you have to be consistent about. But it, it's, really, um, it's really helped me through some dark times. And, and uh, I, know it's, I know a lot of you who, who follow that, uh, that's followed us online for Zen for Minds. We're, we're hoping for more. And all I can say to you is I promise to try and get more soon. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Hi Tomo. Hi, how Tomo. are you? <laughs> yeah, you good. Good, how are you? Good. Uh, so, as you can see, I'm obviously dressed in Hollywood style, so... Yes. My question is obviously related to your time on uh, the Hollywood show for both Supernatural parodies, so my question is just what that experience was like, and if they would do a third one, what would, what would you want it to be? You know what? Nobody's going to tell those ladies what to do. They're, they're creative geniuses. The, the, the proof is in the numbers and the, the amount of views that they've had with the, the things they produce, one and two. They're, they're so funny, man. They're amazing. I, I think it's incredible what they've done. They've carved out a really unique sort of niche, and they've taken different universes and amalgamated them into this amazing SBN fandom. And it's really impressive. Those sisters are so talented. They're so kind and so gracious. They're really, uh, and they're very smart. They're excellent performers. And they understand what the fandom wants and, and maybe didn't even know that it wanted and needed. And it's, it's more comedy. It's more laughs. And uh, they're just, they're great. Um, the first one was very brief for me, and, and many of us who came in, and they were like, listen, we're going to put on some music, you dance for five minutes. <laughs> I was like, okay, that's great. That's easy. And, and then what? They're like, that's it. <laughs> Off you go. <laughs> now we got it. You're good. Um, and then the second one was, you know, I was actually down there. For, yeah, they, uh, they filmed it in Vegas. And uh, I went down, I flew down, and uh, spent a day with them just filming a bunch of different stuff. Um, yeah, if they do a third, of course I'd be in. Of course, they're down. They're 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 so talented, man. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Hi. I'm Jordan. Hi, Jordan. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Okay, so my question for you is, what would you say is your top three all-time favorite moments on Supernatural? Top three um, all-time favorites. Uh, well, you know, whenever I got a good scene with with the boys, that was always enjoyable. Um, I'm an actor and I love to act, so I, I love a well-written scene, something that challenges me, something that I can really sink my teeth into. Um, um, the, you know what I always get asked, and I, every time I'm like, I've got to come up with some new material. I've got to come up with something. Everyone's always like, Jared and Jensen love to play pranks. What prank did they play on you? And I'm always like, they didn't play any pranks on me. They're always busting your balls. The guys are always joking around. That's happening on set all day long. But, um, yeah. I'd be afraid you'd kick their ass. I, I have to say, uh, um, I was working with Jared one day. Uh, sorry, no, it was, it was Jensen. Yeah, Jared's not that complimentary. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was Jensen. And J Jensen, uh, you know, we finished a scene, and uh, I was figuring, because I'd been hearing, I'd been warned about the, um, the jokes, the pranks. And I was always slightly on guard, giving those boys a look like, I don't know if you want to try it. <laughs> Might be around kick involved. Uh, anyway, they came up, uh, or I should say Jensen came up, he, just, he, he said, uh, he said, Tom, I just want to tell you, uh, I think you're a fantastic actor, and um, it was lovely having you on the show. And I was like, really? That's very kind of you. Thank you so much. That's very, that's very nice of you. Thank you very much. And he said, I also want to say that uh, you're incredibly handsome, and um, I think if there was going to be a third brother on the show, I think it would be you. I'm going to talk to the producers. I'm like, Jared, really? Wow, where's this coming from? This is, um, sorry, Jensen. Uh, this is very strange of you to say. I, I'm surprised, thank you. This is very nice of you to say, but you don't have to say that. And he said, I also want to say you're a fantastic musician and an artist, and I like the way you walk. Jensen, thank you so much. You really didn't have to say all those wonderful things. And I'm thinking to myself, because I'm not an artist. I guess I am an artist in some ways. I'm definitely not a, not a musician, but wow, these guys really are as amazing as you think. They really are that kind. Jensen really said those things to me. 
No, you didn't. I made that all up. I made that all up. There was no pranks played. But if that did happen, that would definitely be one of my top three moments on Supernatural. I know he's thinking it. You know what I mean? I see the way he looks at me sometimes. Hi, Tama. Hi, how are you? Uh, I'm good, how are you? Good. good. So uh, I was talking to Jeffrey the other day and he was kind of talking about some of his favorite parts of playing Asmodeus. So I was kind of, kind of wondering what some of your part, favorite parts of playing Gadriel were and how you had fun with that on Supernatural. Um, well, I, I kind of mentioned it before, but I think uh, when Jensen and I really I met Jensen a couple times in Vancouver through mutual friends, but just briefly. And then, um, you know, when we finally worked together, we didn't have a lot of time to talk beforehand. But we had a heavy scene to do. We got right into it. And it was, you know, I gotta say, I was thoroughly impressed at how committed he was and how, when you've been doing a show for a long time, in my experience, working with other actors on different shows, sometimes the actor will dial it in. He's saving the good stuff for his coverage. Acting is a, it's a dance, it's a reciprocal dance, it's a, it's a give and a take. And uh, you gotta be invested, and you gotta give back to your fellow performer. And you also have to accept what they're giving you. Uh, you have to acknowledge it, it's, it's that delicate dance, part of the reason we do it. Um, and I was thoroughly impressed at the energy and the focus that Jensen had. He was so there 100%, and when that happens, it makes it very easy for you to do amazing work also. Because you're there, you're invested, and, and the actor has given you a lot to work with. So for me, that was, that was great. And every time after that, it was always great working with Jensen. Because obviously, Jared and I didn't get to work with each other all that much, uh, <laughs> even though we did, because I was inside him, and I know how that sounds. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, back to Jensen. We got to work together a lot, and that was great. Um, so those were some of my best experiences. But I have to say, too, when you see a show that's been going on as long as this show has, and they've got pretty much the same crew and the same people who have been working with them since the jump, it's such a unique thing, man, because it's, it's, like, a, it's like a large, well-functioning family. Do you know what I mean? Like a family that, you know those families when you go over to your friend's house and you're like, I wish my family was like this. And everybody's laughing and everyone's joking and telling great stories and they just get along. That's kind of how these guys are. They're always taking the piss out of each other. They're always joking around, but it's, and yet they're professional because they're so seasoned and versed at what they've done that, you know, when it's time to work, they turn it on. And when it's not time to work, they just turn it off. So the whole experience for me was, it was really good. And then I've been able to travel the world and do conventions with these guys and all of you uh, as a result of the show. So it's been very good for me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi there. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Uh, I'm Jesse. It's nice Hi, Jesse. to meet you. Um, so I actually first saw you on Dollhouse. So I was really excited when I was watching Supernatural and I saw you came and I was like, I know him. And it was awesome. So. I just wanted to ask you about your experience on Dollhouse because I'm a big Joss Whedon fan and I love Eliza and I, I love that show. It was such a good show. Yeah, yeah, it was good. It was good. Um, I've spoken on this before, but the, the, the show had so much hype because Joss Whedon was being wooed back to Fox and everybody knows how that first time around went with... Um, Firefly. You know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Firefly. It just, you know, the show was aired out of order and they just... The relationship didn't end well, um, but there was new people at Fox, uh, new uh, um, uh, you know heads of the studio, and they wooed Joss back, and they told him he could do his thing, and um, it was incredible in the beginning because I was like, I was still doing Battlestar, and I got hired by Joss for Dollhouse, and it's Joss Whedon. I was so excited. I was like, what a transition. My career's going amazing. I can't wait to do this. He told me all about the character. We had a 45 minute conversation. We talked about books and everything. We had a meeting of minds and I'm like, this is gonna be amazing. Um, in a very quick time, we went from the word on the street and in the press was that we were gonna open for 24, which was the big show at the time. That was huge for me. I was so excited. In about a two month period, it went from, you're gonna open for 24 to you're opening on the death slot on Friday night. Um, we're gonna reshoot that pilot, that amazing pilot you did, 
we're going to reshoot a bunch of scenes and we're going to cut it all up and, and, and piece it together and everything's going to be chronologically in a different order because uh, the studio wanted it. So we came out of the gate struggling, unfortunately. And uh, that's why there's a few bumpy episodes, but there's some exceptional ones too, right? Because Joss and his writing staff are so incredible. And so much of the cast was incredible. There was a lot of real talent on there. Yeah, it really was. And it had, if you look at all the shows now and a lot of the topics that are popular, popular like uh, so many of them, uh, the OA, Ultra Carbon, things dealing with outer body experiences, different dimensions, being different, having different personalities downloaded, all these ideas. Joss was so ahead of the game, as he always is. The guy's a genius. So it's unfortunate it didn't go longer, but um, I cherished those two years, and uh, they, were, they were really incredible to me, and um, I made some good friends off of it, too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. My name's Melissa, and um, I was wondering, since Jared was actually the first one to film the drill scenes, yeah. I was wondering if you used his performance to craft your performance, and how so? That's a good question. I usually get asked this. Um, so I didn't realize that Jared had played uh, Ezekiel or Gadriel first. I didn't know that. I thought I'd been hired to play the guy. So I came in with my choices, and I'm like, I'm playing an angel. This is amazing. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I made some very specific choices. And then the day that I was going to do my very first scene, the director comes up to me and he says, hey, would you like to see what Jared's done? And I said, what Jared's done with what? <laughs> and he said, well, playing e Ezekiel, who we thought was Ezekiel, right? Um, I said, what do you, what, come again, what do you mean? What, I, I'm, I'm, I'm playing him, for, am I not going, have I not, am, has he already done this? I thought I was going first. I was told I was I, I was going first. And he's like, yeah, no, he's done it. He's done a he's done a big scene. And he said, but um, we're gonna shoot in five minutes. So do you want to see that? <laughs> yeah, I was like, I, I guess so. I mean, <laughs> leave it the show. You know, maybe I should see what he's doing if I'm gonna be playing him. Thank you so much for that generous five minutes. I really appreciate that. You got a lot more belief in my talent than I do. Um, Wow, I stressed out instantly when he said that. I was like, oh my God, come on, please. So I saw what he did. Luckily, what he did was so specific. He was, you know, he had, he, the, the way he was moving and he had a very uh, almost supernatural, almost superhero type yeah, thing that he was word. doing. And he even slightly changed his cadence. And the way he was speaking was kind of in line with the way I pictured. I pictured Gadriel speaking kind of like a as if he was from a different era. He's an angel. You know, he's not, he has no, he has no, uh, there's no reference to, to um, you know, social norms at this time, current contemporary things. So he, he would speak in a different way. And, and Jared was doing specific stuff that just kind of worked with what I, I planned, luckily. Um, so I had a mini, mini panic attack. Um, and then uh, I saw what he did, and then I just went and did my thing, and it, it all ended up working out in the end. But I am very happy that he was doing what he was doing and it was close to what I was doing and not something completely different because I think if that was the case, that, um, that six episode arc would have turned into a one episode arc. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, how are you? Nervous. <laughs> are you really? Yeah. Yeah, you know what, that's totally normal. I get nervous too. Um, I'm also a big fan of Dollhouse. It's one of mine and my sister's favorite shows. Okay, great. So thank you for that. You you did an amazing job. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering if there was any, if you felt there was any similarities between Paul and Gadriel. Hmm. Interesting. Let me turn that on you really quickly. What did you did you What did you see that were similar other than that handsome actor who played? No, I'm just <laughs> I mean the looks. I mean. Come on now. Um, there was like just the strong sense of they both felt what they were doing was right. Yeah. And then of course sometimes they turned dark. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. But I I thought you did a wonderful job as both, and I was like really excited. So I just wondered if you what your thought was on that. No, that's felt. good. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean I I was lucky enough. Um, for a long period in the beginning of my 
my career, I was playing a lot of moral, sort of upstanding, solid, moral compass characters. Um, and even though Gudriel was so flawed and he had made a lot of mistakes, um, he still had that in him. Ultimately, originally, he was a soldier. He wanted to serve God. That's who he was. And then things went wrong, and he was punished and imprisoned for thousands of years and tortured, and he came out broken. You know, he had, he, that, that angel had PTSD, man. Um, so, you know, we have to we have to acknowledge that with him. I, it's way more interesting playing a character who who tries to do the best they can, as most of us do, but who makes mistakes, who fumbles along the way, because that's what we do. Nobody's perfect. And too often in film and television, you see these steely, sort of superhero-like characters who don't make any mistakes, and everything they say is perfect, and there's, I, I'm not interested in that. I'm, I, I like seeing conflict and, and, uh, and, and, and people doubting themselves, because people do. You know, and I think that's what we relate to. We relate to characters like that, who are flawed, who do make mistakes, but are trying to do the right thing. And uh, I definitely agree with you. There were similar similarities between the two. I, to be honest with you, with Dollhouse, I think I was coming in, and I really, I wanted Paul to be a much darker character than he was. What Josh shared with me about him, I try to play him a little darker. Um, but uh, Josh came to me and was like, listen, there's, there's, we need to see this other side of him, so let's rein it back a little bit. But that was good. I needed that at the time because um, there's a very specific tone in each show too. And Joss Whedon has a very specific tone. He's he's one of those great, amazing artists who can have really heavy, dark like scene material, and then the next one is so light, so much levity and humor to it, and it's quick. His wit is very. It's his own, you know what I mean? So you have to acknowledge that. That was a big lesson for me as an actor, too. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, what I wanted to know was, uh, if there was one person, past, present, living or dead, whatever, that you could meet, sit for five minutes with and talk to, who would it be and what would you ask? Mm, that's a great question. What about you? What about you? Um, either Elvis Presley, and I would ask him, you know, what was his influence, or Marilyn Monroe, because she's hot. <laughs> <laughs> I think Marilyn Monroe was very, very, uh, from what I've read, she was a very, very intelligent woman, too. She was sharp. She was. She would have been interesting to talk to, for sure. Um, I would have loved to have had a conversation with um, Quanah Parker who was a Comanche war chief. Yeah. I think that would have been fascinating to sit down with that man. It, it, to be honest with you, if I, if I could have that choice, it would, it would probably be a family member. I think we're all curious about where we come from and probably even more curious about our parents and their parents too. And we, we unfortunately, you know, because of age, because they pass on so quickly, we don't often get that sort of deep, intimate conversation and knowledge about our history, and who we are, where we come from, uh, because, you know, people pass on. I would love to have a real conversation with, you know, any of my great-grandparents. My great-grandfather on my mother's side was alive till I was six or seven. So I remember it. I remember being around him, but he didn't speak English very well. Um, this is a man who lived off the land until he was 99 years of age. He was living in the woods the way our people on my mother's side have for tens of thousands of years, in the toughest country in North America, arguably the world. He was rugged as shit, and he was a powerful man, but he didn't speak English very well, so I don't really remember any deep conversations with him. I wish that I had my language, I wish that I had, I could speak our language, and me at this age could have a long conversation with my great grandfather. That would be amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Hi, it's Chloe. Hi, Chloe. Um, so my question is that if Gadriel were still alive, how do you think that would affect like you as an actor, Gadriel, and like basically the show in general? H how do I think what? 
How do you think that would like affect you and the character and basically how the show is run so far? Mm, I mean, it'd be great to, to play him again. I mean, it, it's the supernatural universe. Let's be honest. There's, <laughs> anything could happen. He could show up in the next episode. You guys be like, oh, cool. That's great. Wouldn't be unbelievable. You know what I mean? Be like, oh, there's a good drill. That's so great. I was hoping you'd come back. Because this show is like that, which is fantastic. It's part of the reason people love it. Um, I, I've said this before, but I think I think there would be there would be a beautiful opportunity for Misha, who's now got all this, you know, this current uh, knowledge about uh, you know politics and humor and and and, and media and, and culture that uh, he never had before to be sort of taking the. The uh, the piss out of his his unknowing angel, uh, Gadriel. They we saw only one brief scene of that, you know, with this, the the few scenes that Misha and I shared, and I think uh, there would be uh, there would be more of that. Um, it'd be great to work with uh, Jared too, you know, to work with him more. We we worked a bit together, uh, but not a ton. And I, I just he's a sweetheart, man. He's a great guy, and I'd love to work with him. Um, they can do anything in this show. I would be down if I was available and it was happening and it all worked out. Um, I'd be absolutely honored to come back and play with uh, the Supernatural gang. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, so I know you said before that you like to do your own stunts and yeah. you like to be challenged and you've had some injuries. And I was curious if there's any stunts that you would not be willing to do. Yeah, there's, there's lots of them. It's, you know what it comes down to is when there's a fight scene, I'm doing it. Almost always. That said, there were scenes in Dollhouse where parts of the fight scene I was not doing. Because my character is falling off of the back of the car onto his upper back, like basically his neck. I'm not good enough to do that. I'm going to go and try that and I'm going to break my own neck. Um, it just, and the fact that the stunt people, the doubles they had for us could do that is incredible. I'm, the stunt community, stunt performers in general, do not get all acknowledged enough. They are incredible. They are amazing. They are amazing. They should be recognized for their own academy. It's ridiculous that they don't have a category recognizing their accomplishments. These people risk their lives all the time. They get injured, they get hurt, and they die. It happens. It happens. Look in the press the last couple of years. It's, it's a dangerous job. I've got a lot of people in that world who are very dear to me. Um, but you know, when it comes to fight scene and stuff like that, and I, I'm all about it, because I've been doing it a long time and I move in a very specific way, and the few times that I've let them, not even let them, they've gone and sort of, like I'll give you an example. There was a scene in, um, in Castle where they got a stunt guy for me and he was, the kid was, you know, he was rugged, he was, a, he was a, maybe a little shorter than me, but he was a, kind of a burly guy and he, injured his ankle, which was obvious to me right away, because I'm an observant person, especially the way people move. I think a lot of martial artists can tell another martial artist just by looking at them. I've always found that. I can tell when somebody trains, more times than not. But he'd injured his ankle, and he, he's kind of bow-legged, and he just kind of walked different than me, and everything. And even when we were like playing out the fight scene, the way he moved was so different. So, um, we had a scene, and I, I did as much stuff as I could. We were shooting this incredible scene downtown LA on like a 17th floor of a building, and I'm like trying to throw the lead off the top of the building at one point. Um, but I ended up seeing the episode, and I was I felt great about it, and I saw the, the coverage they used, and they had gone and done some second unit stuff, some um, you know second unit stuff with a helicopter, and up on top they've got a you know. A, a shot from way above, so you can't quite see the actors or me, which I knew right away it wasn't me because we never did any helicopter shots when I was shooting. And there's this guy walking across the roof, like, <laughs> and doing this fight scene, and he looks so different than me. The way he moved and everything, it was just not me. And I was, it's just one of those little things. I was so frustrated because I was like, no, that was mine, and I should have done that, and I hate that. But, um, yeah, there's lots of stuff, man. The stunt performers will come in and they'll take over. I'm never trying to claim that I'm this superhero or what have you, but I've been doing martial arts a long time, and I could take a bump. I could take more than a few. I, you know, I got punched in the face by an actor I was doing a fight scene with last year, right in the middle of the scene. We didn't stop the scene, we just kept going. Because um, he didn't punch that hard. 
<laughs> I've been punched a lot harder than that. And, uh, you know, um, these things happen, but there's crazy stuff that uh, I'm just smart enough, you know, the, and the, the stunt coordinator usually say to you, too, like, they know once they've seen what you've done or if they're not familiar with you, and uh, they'll come in and be like, look, I'd be more comfortable if you let my guy do this. You know, if it's a, if it's a big fall, if it's something where there's a good chance it could really hurt my knee, something that's going to put me out for a long time, I'm not into it. You know, but when it comes to the actual fight scenes, getting pulled back, getting hit, things like that, I'm down. I've been hurt a lot worse than that. Thank you. Well, I appreciate what you said about stunt teams. Yeah. Oh, they're amazing. I know. I'm Anyway. Um, my well, question, thank you. My question is, is, what is the most interesting thing you've had to learn to do for a role? The most interesting thing I've had to learn to do? Um, hmm. You know what the problem is? When you do film, and especially if there's a budget, let me back it up. Part of the reason I wanted to become an actor when I was a young man, I was a little boy growing up in northern Canada, being in an isolated tiny community, was I'd see these characters on screen, and I'd be like, Dad, is that really the actor playing the piano? And he'd be like, yes, that's the actor playing the piano. You can see that he's doing that. That's not a special effect. And I'm like, well, do you think he played it before? And I, you know, my father would say, I bet you he didn't, but this is a big budget film. They probably trained him for six months to do this. And I just thought that was incredible. I'm like, wow. And he got to do it in this, you know, this different city and this different era. To me, that, that was just, I thought, man, if I could do that, that would be incredible. To, to learn, a, 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 to play an instrument, a, a martial art, to do an accent, to do it in this era, to travel to, to do a film in Tahiti or some exotic place. That was always something that really, really attracted to me. Um, but unfortunately, oftentimes, as actors in this business, we just don't have that luxury. We get the roles not soon before. We're rarely given the time to prepare the way we want to. Um, and uh, there's only been a few times where I've had, like when I did Altered Carbon, that was actually one of the first times probably in my career where we were doing the stunt rehearsals a month and a half before we shot, which was incredible. We were rehearsing an amazing performance a huge level fight with many different players and so many different beats, something that you would have to rehearse the hell out of to be safe so no one would get hurt. That was incredible for me, but that was one of the few times I was able to do that. I'd say the most challenging or interesting thing I've been asked to do is accents. <clears throat> I've done a few different dialects professionally. All of them I would say I wish I had more time to work on them because they were always very last minute, but uh, it's something I'm trying to work on in my own time, privately, because I think, you know, it really, um, to get an accent, you can work with a dialect coach as much as you want, but to get the, the inflection, the brightness, the authenticity of a dialect, you have to be familiar with the culture. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oftentimes you'll hear American actors or North American actors do British accents, <laughs> and there's something missing. Yeah. It's because they haven't spent time over there. They don't understand British culture. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's the one thing. So. That's something I'd like to work on more, and I'm actually trying to do on my own in my class, and uh, just outside of work professionally, just doing it as my own practice. Good. Yeah. Right, Thank you. Hi. Hi. How um, are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Um, I had a question about your interest in the martial arts, like what you practice, have been in, and how long, and why you started. Mm, I think I started, um, I started in Judo when I was maybe around 10 or 11, and I did that for a few years, and I really enjoyed it, but then I was trying to balance it with hockey, and it didn't work out. They were on the same yeah, nights, and it was always one of my regrets that I didn't um, continue it, because I was always kind of a, I, I felt I really enjoyed it, and I was pretty good at it, uh, and I, I I've never really committed to the grappling martial arts since then. It's always been something that I've wanted to, but I, I, I was, I'm from that generation that saw like Bruce Lee and things like that, and from a very young age, I, uh, I just knew that I wanted to learn, you know, how to strike in particular, like the striking martial arts. I was always fascinated by boxing and kicking and any of the striking martial arts, Taekwondo, um, 
yeah, there you go, karate, anything, anything that I saw. The first time I saw Muay Thai, like really saw it in a film, um, was, uh, was Bloodsport. And the actor who played the Thai fighter in it, ironically, is a South African named Paolo, Paolo Tocha. And I'll tell you a funny story real quick. After years of training Muay Thai, I went to LA and I was living down there for a bit and I was trying to find a Muay, Muay Thai gym. And I'd heard about Bomb Squad, which is where Chuck Liddell used to train. Chuck Liddell was a former UFC uh, light heavyweight champion. And I went to that gym, and there was a guy at the desk. He was bald and probably about 50, but a very intense face and eyes. And I kept looking at him going, I really recognize this guy. Who is this guy? Anyway, he signed me up, and he was going to be teaching a class that night. And it wasn't until the next class that I figured out that it was Paulo Tocha. He's the guy who's... He had the big mustache in Bloodsport, for any of you who've seen that Jean-Claude Van Damme classic. He's the one Muay Thai fighter out of the, in the whole Kumite thing. So, I remember seeing the way he moved and then finding out more about Muay Thai, and I was like, that is probably the most devastating, effective looking, striking martial art I've ever seen. So, as soon as I moved to the city and I was able to access it, I started training in it. It's still my favorite. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, so my question is that post God leaving heaven, um, out of all the angels, uh, Castiel has had like the most connection to him, like between the Winchesters and then God bringing him back. So do you think if Gadriel had known that, he would have sided with Cass instead of Metatron? Probably. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. What do you think? Knowing, see, yeah, having seen the performance of Gadriel and the way he acted over the, uh, the arc that you saw, what do you think? Um, I think he still would have gone with Metatron. Yeah? Yeah, just because I don't think he enjoyed like how the Winchesters were and Cass was too, like, you know, gung-ho with whatever they wanted to do. Like, Gadriel was a lot more, like, play-by-the-book and, like, it just, Metatron, like, played up to that. Mm-hmm, he did. He did manipulate him for a long time, didn't he? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Thank you for that. Thanks. You have to ask me a question now. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I'm just curious. If Supernatural brought you back for season 15 as a different character, what character would you want that to be? I have no idea, man. I mean, I, I'd be down. I'm always into a challenge, man. If they wanted me to play someone else, I'd, I'd be into it. <laughs> um, wow, I don't know. Like any character that's already been on Supernatural. Oh, any character that's already been on Supernatural. Um, how about Mark Shepard's role? <laughs> Fine. I always remember that scene turning on the television one time randomly and he's like, getting massaged and <laughs> the woman is rubbing him down and Shepard just looks so happy. I'm like, <laughs> I said, you, I want that scene. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So I have a quick cut. He's real enthused with your panel. Sorry. I can see that. <laughs> um, so my question is, my last name sounds nothing like it's spelled, and I'm wondering how many people screw up your name. Because honestly, I didn't know how to say it until your panel. Yeah, they screwed up uh, every day of my life. <clears throat> every day of my life, I'm pretty used to it. Yeah, um, yeah, they always screw it up. They always do. It's, I can't fault them for it. It's, it's a unique name. My, my first and last name are unique. Um, it always amazes me how how... People sometimes throw in an extra syllable, though. It's the strangest thing. I used to have teachers do that. They'd call me like Timote or something. <laughs> Timo, Timote, Tumaha. 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 <laughs> what? T A H M O H. Timoha? <laughs> You're an English teacher. Where did you study again? <laughs> Where did you get your degree? <laughs> um, I got to a point when I was young, I just stopped correcting people. I get so frustrated with people slaughtering my name. Um, now I'm a little bit more patient. I'll, I'll try and teach you like maybe three times after that. I'm, that's it. <laughs> Can't help you anymore. 
It's funny how people screw up the last name too. It's a British name. Um, it's not very, it is very unique though. It's not common at all. Pennicut. Um, but people manage to screw that one up too. Yes, you should have heard the guy at the, the airport yesterday. Well, my last name is L A U S I E R. And it's pronounced Lozier. Okay. And I've been called Lazier, Lozier. Can you spell it one more time? L A U S I E R. So is it originally French or? French, yes. Yeah. Lozier. Yeah. Lozier. Lozier. Well, that's what it is now, yes. yes. At one point it was Lozier. <laughs> Well, I, I don't do the whole thing. Si tu parles français, dossier. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Well, it's a beautiful name. Thank and, you. And uh, I feel your pain. <laughs> I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel rich close by. Maybe he'll text me by the end of the day. Hi. Hi. Hey, you. I know you. I was coming because I saw no one. Um, you told a lovely story in Rome about your new friends on the Spanish steps and some necklaces. I was thinking that could, if there's no one else with questions, you know. I wish I could tell. I wish I could do this justice. I, you, I gotta remember this. Yeah. <laughs> we, the boys and I. I think it was Jason, Men and I, and Jensen. I don't know. A few of us were. We were sitting. We were, we were actually at the hotel and a gentleman, an African gentleman went by and he had this, this beautiful necklace and he was like, you know, my friend, um, I want to give this to you. And I said, no, no, my friend, it's okay. I don't need this. We were actually in deep conversation too. You know when you're in deep conversation and someone just interrupts and then they won't stop interrupting? You try and make it obvious, you feel them coming up. And you get a little more intense to your conversation, maybe you even turn your back a little bit more towards them, <laughs> and yet they're going to come in anyway. That was this guy. And he insisted, he kept interrupting, my friend, I want to give you this necklace for your child. I said, how do you know I have a child? He goes, I know you have a child. And I said, my friend, I don't need your necklace. I appreciate it. Thank you. It's a beautiful necklace. We don't need this necklace. I insist on giving you this He wouldn't give it up. So finally I was like, okay, my friend. Give me this necklace. Thank you so much. That's so generous of you. Gave me the necklace. I looked at the necklace. I showed the boys on the table. Everyone agreed it was a beautiful necklace. And then he was like, my friend. I said, yeah, yeah can I help you? And he's... <laughs> what does it mean? Do you want the necklace back? I'll give you back the necklace. And he's like, my friend, I've got to feed my children, please. It was the funniest thing. I, I'm not doing this story justice. It was a lot funnier when I told it fresh in my mind. She did set me up for it, but then we had a long conversation. I'm like, but why would you do that? Why did you just ask me for money right off the bat? And then we can, we can establish that, and we can be honest with each other. But this went on for a long time, and of course, I ended up paying him to leave me alone. And then, um, uh, so he won. He was very practiced at this, trust me. He had no issues with this, uh, this game of his. And then I saw him the next day, and he came up, and he almost tried it again. And I gave him a look like, don't even try. And he's like... But he had no qualms about coming up and doing it to one of the other guys that I was at the table with. And I'm like, come on! Yeah, that yeah, was a funny experience. Uh, oh, I've got a question. Yeah, Ooh. I got a question. Hi. Hey, I'm always thinking about like self-care and helping people, <laughs> helping people um, <laughs> have a better life, especially in anxiety. Yeah. What, what do you think is the best way to start someone off with meditation? What if I could teach someone the first five minutes or that kind of thing, what could they do? What I would say is this day and age, we are inundated with so much social media and negative news, and it's just everyone's in a state of anxiety, constantly. We've never had a period. You used to get the paper. You used to be able to decide, do I want to read the paper right now? There's going to be a lot of negative in it. I'm going to leave that. I'm going to have breakfast with my kids. I'm going to look at my child as he tells me about the soccer game yesterday. I'm going to enjoy this food, you know. You could turn off the television and not listen to it. Now we, got, we, we carry it by our heart. The phone is giving you negative shit every two seconds and you can't ignore it. I don't care who you are. You can't be that solid as an individual to, to, to protect yourself from that. So I would encourage all of you, number one, to just ease up on the news, ease up on the negativity. You're not being, you're not helping yourself or your family by being that informed. There's too much to be informed about. It's not doing anything for your headspace, your spirituality, your, your, your mental health.
try and get silence here and there. Turn off the phone, number one. If you're going to meditate, turn that phone off. Turn off the computer. Know that you're not going to be interrupted by an email beep or a text or what have you. And just breathe. Conscious breaths. And that's a hard enough thing to do, even for five minutes. And if you find yourself getting distracted, bring it back. Try and do 16 breaths. 16 breaths is a good practice to start with. If you can do that clearly, and you're focused, and maybe you only you know, get distracted a couple times, you can easily drop in and do an actual meditation after that. That is an initial step. If you can encourage someone to do that, I guarantee they'll tell you it helped them. It's good to quiet the mind here and there. And I thank you for helping people and wanting to spread that out there, because we need more of it. You guys, thank you so much. You've been fantastic. It is always, and I will never make the mistake again of not calling here for dinner. It will never happen again, I can assure you. He is a national treasure of several nations, including the United States and Canada. That right there is Tomo Pinnacat! Me <laughs> fucking up the lyrics. <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's, I, I meant to. I'm ta I meant to say monsoon. It's a lot of things. You, if for pe people who are detail fans uh, who like to take the shows, go back and Rob has some very creative lyrics. Singing. Oh, week to week, day to day, show to show. And then a lot of people who don't know the song is called Bad Girls. Really, they think it's just called Girls because every time you go, Girls, <laughs> or it's called Girls, Bad Girls. Girls, bad girls. But we're not talking about bad girls right now, we're talking about all girls. Because we got a panel that's wall 